Welcome to the DJE Podcast, where you will learn about real estate investing from real life examples. Here's your host, Devin Elder. Hey guys, today on the show, I've got a, a really special guest. I say that every time, but the, the Adrian Salazar is our guest today. And um, we're going to go into a really cool story. You guys are going to like to hear a little bit about him before we get started. He's a full-time real estate investor. Started at 17 years old, wholesaling single family. That might be familiar to, to some of you guys. Uh, did that for over three years and then has transitioned into multifamily uh, starting about three years ago. So he's wholesaled dozens and dozens of houses, uh, some with, with multiple six-figure fees, and he's bought and managed over 130 units. They're a vertically integrated property management company, meaning they run the acquisitions and own the management company. And he's runs boots on the ground operations and, and uh, does acquisitions too. So that's kind of the high level without any further ado, Adrian, welcome. How are you? Thank you. Thank you, Devin, for that. Doing great. Doing great. Thanks for uh, having me on the show. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you told me a story a few weeks back that I, I was like, we have to get this on the podcast because it's fantastic. Um, it's about an acquisition and, um, and we'll get into that in a minute for sure. But, you know, before we kind of dive into that for somebody listening, maybe that hasn't met you already, what, what's your background and how did you get into, how did you get into this real estate game? Sure. Yeah. So when I was about 16, 17, I got introduced to a multi-level marketing company. Um, and so, you know, I know a lot of people are not a fan of them, but they did start developing, you know, um, the habits necessary to be successful as far as studying the greats like Jim Rohn, studying the greats like Bob Proctor, Tony Robbins, all those guys that really I got introduced to at a very young age and started really getting obsessed with, with personal development uh, because of this multi-level marketing career that I was a part of. And so long story short, it kind of, you know, went, went, it fell through, it fell down and uh, I started looking at other options, other, 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 other things. And, and I found real estate. I came across real estate. There was a Robert Kiyosaki ad uh, that I saw on Facebook. And because of my personal development early on, I knew who that was. And right. I knew that I needed to go see him. I thought it was going to be him there. But of course, it was one of his coaches. Um, showed up, free event. Started talking all about pre-foreclosures, wholesaling, flipping houses. And I was like, dude, I could do that. I could, I could do that. And so, um, you know, that kind of jumped me into the real estate game, um, met a mentor, started working for free for him and really started implementing those things that I started developing early on. Uh, so that's kind of how I got into real estate. Now, I mean, the whole process between then and now has been, has been a ride in the journey, but uh, I think, you know, it all came down to just an open mind, having that open mind in the beginning. Yeah, that makes sense. And getting exposed to some of those success principles early on that are kind of general. I mean, I had a similar experience when I was very young reading some books um, that planted some ideas about how to approach things that stuck with me well, you know, well before I got into real estate. Um, and it's good. It's good. It's good to have that framework of, of uh, you know, essentially never quitting, right? I mean, that's, if you could boil it all down to just persistence, right? Yeah. Um, but th that's great that you're exposed to some of those concepts early and then able to bring that to real estate. So you've made the transition into the multifamily world from the single family world. They're really two kind of very different worlds. What was the trigger for you to want to make that, that shift? I mean, you had success wholesale in houses, you had success in that world. And I think it's been my experience that, you know, if somebody's successful at something, they, a lot of times they don't want to move because, you know, you've already worked hard to be successful in one arena to go be, be a, a beginner, start over, build another network and in another arena, like going from single family to multifamily can be challenging and you got to get out of your comfort zone and you kind of got to, got to ignore the success you've already had and move on. What was that for you that caused that shift? So, I mean, for the first, I would say year and a half, of single being in the single family industry, I was learning a lot. So I was, uh, you know, excited. I was hustling. I, I kind of didn't really know any other way for the first good year and a half. Um, and then, you know, we started really scaling the acquisition side. So I got really good at finding deals. I got really good at, um, you know, knocking on doors, calling owners and talking to people to, to, and to find motivated sellers. So I got really good at that side and I started really scaling it. Um, and, and I ended up having a system of people knocking for me, people calling for me, 
but you know, it just got to where it was just a lot of wholesaling. It was very transactional. You know, we close a deal. Yeah. You make a fee, but you got to go out and find the next one. And then you got to go back to the beginning. And unless you have a really big pipeline full of deals, that's constantly closing and, and, and really automate those wholesaling systems. I mean, I didn't really see that, that, that future for me staying in that realm for that long. Um, so then, you know, me and my, uh, you know, ex partners, we, we looked into flipping and, you know, I heard all kinds of horror stories about flipping and, you know, foundation problems, especially in San Antonio, it was a big deal. And I mean, just, you know, appraisals not coming in. And so it was just like a lot, but I was still going through it. I didn't, I didn't know about multifamily. I didn't really know about repositioning apartments syndications. I just knew that I could wholesale a house, make 10,000, make 8,000 buyers, happy sellers, happy. And I liked it. And I just kept going and going. It was quick. I didn't need any money. I didn't have, you know, an established credit score. So that's kind of the only way that I knew um, until I really started, I would say about three years into the single family space where I started saying like, Hey, wh where, where am I going? Like, what am I doing? You know, what's that next level? Cause I always want to level up. I'm always trying to you know, buy a bigger property, meet a, another investor, you know, and so I'm trying to level up and I, I just couldn't level up with wholesaling and single family. So I uh, saw multifamily and I saw how you can, you know, force appreciation on buildings and, you know, create value. And, and I just couldn't, I couldn't pass on it. So I just implemented the same thing in single family that I was doing to generate leads into multifamily, smaller multis in the beginning and saw a little bit of success early on. Love it. So you got, you got exposed to that world. It is a different world. Flipping houses can be heartbreaking. Wholesaling is a grind. Multifamily has its challenges. The thing I like about multifamily is that you're in general, especially on the larger stuff, you're, you're, you're working with a different crowd, you know, your sellers, your brokers, attorneys, buyers, you, if you buy in five, 10, $20 million buildings, like there's some level of sophistication in general, just as a blanket statement, obviously there are exceptions. I kind of found that refreshing after being in the single family world a while. It's like, Oh, wow, everybody's kind of like a, a business person. And you know, if some, somebody bought a $10 million building, they got some kind of financial wherewithal. And so sure. that's kind of refreshing. Um, yeah. I was actually going to say too, that the, when I was in the, in the single family space, I had to, I had to babysit a lot of homeowners. I had sure. to, you know, hear their sob stories on how they're losing their house. And I had to help them move and pack boxes for that. I mean, I did whatever it took going down to that. Right. But, right. Uh, you know, it's just a whole, like you said, it's a whole different seller. And, and these apartment investors, they're investors. I like talking to them. They like talking to me. We're right. talking business from day one, you know? So um, it's a whole different avatar that you're dealing with. And I'd rather deal with these guys. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, I, I would always say these single family houses that we used to buy, um, there was never a good story that you're getting a house at a discount. There's never a, there's never a happy story. There was always either, you know, sad or in some places just like downright heartbreaking. Right. And you're still helping people get out of a bad situation, but yeah, in the multifamily world, d different stories. So that's great. Well, I want to kind of bring it to, to present times and congratulate you on a deal that you uh, and your partner very recently closed. And we don't necessarily have to name the, the deal or whatever, but um, I do want to talk a little bit about the acquisition story because uh, I'll share a little bit that hopefully is not sharing too much, but I talked to your partner um, as this deal was kind of falling apart and had basically gone away. And I, I, I said to him, well, listen, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes these things happen and um, you know, you can pick yourself up and, and carry on. And then he texts me like a few days later that you had saved this deal. And I was scratching my head going, well, how did that happen? And then you, you know, you actually told me how that happened. So maybe you could kind of share, um, you know, the genesis of, of how you found this project and then basically got it all the way to closing and funding recently. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, uh, pretty cool story. I mean, from the very beginning, um, we, we, we had, we had actually generated this lead a couple of years ago and didn't work out. It was, you know, it was a lot of units vacant. So we actually ended up negotiating something with a seller to allow us to go in there and lease a bunch of units um, to, to then increase the occupancy to then go under contract for a certain price and then maintain a, a certain, you know, 90% above occupied. So there was a lot of things that have, you know, that I had to put my sweat equity in, in the very beginning to even get the deal, to even get it under contract. 
So, you know, we went in there at least like 15 units in like two weeks. You know, we got, we went under contract. I mean, this I before all- contract. I mean, this is very unorthodox here. So you're yeah. helping the seller get to occupancy and maybe, you know, for the education of some listeners, what, you know, why are you wanting 90% occupancy versus 80% occupancy on the, when you're buying it? Sure. So we wanted to tap into one of the best loans that we could get on, on a multifamily property, a Fannie Mae. And so they required us to be 90% occupied and collected for us for to be considered a stabilized asset that they'd be loaning on for a solid 90 days straight. So in order for them to release funds to us, to, to give us the loan and approve the loan, the property needed to be stable and for it to be stable, it needed to be over 90% occupied, 90% collected for a consistent 90 days. So, so we were in there aggressively maintaining that 90 um, to, to, to be able to go under contract because the minute it falls under, you, you have to start again, right? So, and this, uh, is before, this is before contract. You guys are like helping them with their operations yeah. just to win the deal, right? Yeah, I mean, we yeah. literally came in and stormed the leasing office and threw everybody aside. I mean, you know, there was there was units there was units that were almost ready that were just like a couple hundred dollars and it'd be ready and I could lease them. I have a whole leasing system. I mean, we're I have virtual assistants blasting. So I mean, I didn't have an issue, and I had told my partner I could do it. Like I'll go in there and I'll lease them quick. So we went in there and, and took over all their operations. All, I got all the keys. I mean, we got all the materials. They gave me their Lowe's card. I mean, I, I was going to Lowe's getting materials on their, on their, on their dime basically, but I was helping. Pre-contract. Them. Pre-contract. I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And right. so, so, um, so we finally, we finally, you know, got up there above 90. And so it's contract time, right? We agree to something it's contract time. So it went under contract and, you know, it was one of the biggest raises we've ever done. I mean, t- 10 times the amount of money that we've raised on the other ones. Right. So uh, we went, we went to the phones, we started hitting the phones and hitting all the investors, creating the investor packet. And while at the same time too, maintaining that 90%. So, you know, there was, you know, residents moving out. And so we needed to maintain that. And I had all my team on it. Um, and so then We kept raising. And so during this time, we generated a 33 unit off market deal that uh, that I was going to wholesale. So I was wholesaling it. um, And so I ended up finding a seller, 33 unit wholesaling it to a buyer, to a local buyer here, double closing on it. And then the seller of the 33 unit 1031 into our 16 unit. Um, so we ended up selling our 16 unit and then I bought a house in San Antonio. So I was working this whole four transaction deal during the money raising of Plaza during the whole you know, loan process, everything. And so that took about 80 days to close that four transaction wholesale deal, six figure fee, crazy, crazy property, best deal of my career. Um, and so then we finally closed on this and my partner had been working on, you know, this acquisition, I was working on this acquisition. So we kind of split the roles, um, split the roles up and, you know, I closed on it and I was, you know, I was ready to close on Plaza. And then, you know, it was just a closing date that we couldn't get to. And our lender needed more time to close the, the, the property, just two more weeks. All he needed was a week, two more weeks to close the property which was, you know, uh, the, the, the apartment complex and, and that apartment complex, this apartment complex is that next jump for me. Like it's that next jump for me and my partner. It's that next property that's going to get us, you know, closer to where we want to go. Right. And so when we heard that the sellers were not willing to extend the contract, um, that kind of put us, you know, in a weird spot, in a weird situation, a couple days before our closing date, we were kind of assuming that, they were just going to extend it. No problem. You know, no, no questions asked, you know, we learned so many things um, throughout this process, definitely put some contingency agreements. I know uh, we were talking about that at the gun range the other day, but, um, but yeah, some definitely some contingencies that we, that we should have put in there that we didn't, uh, but we learned. And so um, the sellers just said, no, we're not doing the deal. That's it. You guys didn't close. And the closing date was Thanksgiving day. And so we found some loopholes that um, pushed us to Monday. So Thanksgiving was Thursday, Friday, because it was a holiday, Friday would be the closing date. 
So then we had, we had Friday, but then our attorney found some loopholes and we had till Monday. So we found out the sellers were not going to extend on Tuesday. So a couple days before our closing date. And so I, you know, my partner and I were barbecuing outside. I remember, and he told me, and I mean, my heart fell to my toes. I mean, I felt like just numb. I, I was a ghost. I didn't know what to think. Cause you know, it's just, it was, we did so much. We already had almost $2 million raised. You know, we had about 45,000 of hard costs out, you know, just lingering around, not including the earnest money. Um, and so, I mean, and, and not only that, but our reputation, I think that was the biggest thing that really, you know, no took me, took me to the next leap, but so it's the I, biggest deal. This is a level up. This is a bigger deal than you guys have done in every respect. And it's, it's falling apart. It's going away. It's, it's literally no one is responding to us. Our attorneys are saying, you know, that's it. They're out. The other attorneys out the, the, the sellers, we tried skip tracing and cold calling. They said that they, you know, they want to talk to the attorneys, the attorneys have to communicate with each other. And it was just the attorneys, the attorneys, the attorneys, we could not get anybody on the phone. We showed up, uh, my partner and I showed up to the bank where one of them works and we were asking the loan, the loan people there, like, Hey, we need to talk to this person. We are waiting here. It was COVID. So they were telling us like, there's limited amounts of people, but we were like not moving from the sofa. We were not going to leave that, that location until we talked to somebody. So we were just freaking out. Like we were so freaking out. And so we met, at, you know, the next day, we just figured some things out. There was nothing we could do. And so, you know, everyone kind of just checked out, like everyone checked out Wednesday night. Everyone was going to go spend their time with Thanksgiving on, uh, with their families on Thursday. And me, I'm just thinking like, no, there has to be something. There has to be something. So I ended up sending like a bunch of voice notes to the owners because I was like, they're, they're not, I mean, texting is not going to work. I'm not going to text. I sent like a seven minute voice note to one of the owners. You're trying, talking about just texting audio, how you can do that? Yeah. Because yeah. I was like, I mean, he's, he has to hear it. Like he has to hear it. <laughs> and so, I mean, at this point, I'm trying to do whatever. Yeah. And so, um, what were you saying in your voice notes? Just like, listen, just man. like, you know, I, I think I deserve, you know, I deserve to be talked to. Someone needs to talk to me. I went in at least 15 units. You guys are 98% full. I'm sure you guys are cash flowing amazing right now. Yeah. So, sorry, sorry, Devin. My computer is about to die. Yep. Can you, can you edit your, your podcast? All right. So you've got, you're, you're leaving messages for this guy and um, no responses, right? You're texting him saying that you deserve, you put in a lot of work leasing up his units, which is some risk on your part, right? I mean, you're working for free in order to get this thing occupied where you, where you're going to qualify for this um, high quality agency debt. And you've, you've laid all that groundwork, done all this work. And then they're just ghosting you. They're gone deals off. Like what no, about your earnest money? Where, I mean, would you have like fifty thousand dollars earnest money that you're about to lose on top of your pursuit costs, right? Yeah, it was a, actually they were willing to return that earnest to us. So they were right. saying we will return your earnest money, but we're not doing the deal anymore. Like you guys, but that, if they're giving your money back, they're serious about not doing that deal. I mean, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. And so we were debating like, all right, do we just take the earnest money and then not risk? it going Tuesday and not being able to get it back. So we ended up like, Hey, look, so everyone was checked out. Everyone, everyone was checked out. Everyone was like, we're losing this deal. <clears throat> what are we going to tell people? What are we going to tell everybody? And so, um, I remember going, it was my niece's birthday that, that night. And so I went to, to my little family reunion. I was white. I was pale. Like, I mean, everyone knew that something was up. This is Wednesday and before Thanksgiving. Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, I was, I was thinking that, you know, I'm just going to go drive. Cause I have that, that, that mentality of I'll find someone, if I need to find someone to talk to them, or if I need to find the owner of a property, I'll find them. Like I have to. So I, I knew I could, you know, use my resources and resourcefulness that I, you know, I've, I created within myself to be able to find this guy, uh, because the majority owner lived in Lubbock. So there was, there was a couple owners, like four owners, there was a majority owner and then three local owners that, that uh, were part of this asset. Um, and so the three, the three guys um, were kind of the ones in spokesperson with everyone, my business partner, the lender, uh, you know, roofing company. It was, it, was a, it was someone who probably owned 10% of the building. So um, we knew that the majority decision maker was in Lubbock 
And so, uh, you know, I, these guys weren't going to be able to do anything. So I, uh, I kind of, I got a little motivated just being around my family, actually being around my, you know, my family and just knowing that, you know, we're about to lose this deal. And it's going to, it was making me feel horrible. So I booked the flight. Uh, I was actually going to drive. I was going to have a buddy. I was going to pay a buddy to drive me to Lubbock. Um, but I actually ended up just flying. So I took a one-way flight, um, told the, told my partner, told my other team guys, I'm flying to Lubbock. Thanksgiving uh, morning. This is, I flew out Thanksgiving morning. Yeah. yeah. Like at seven 30 in the morning. So I flew out. Um, didn't really know. I only took one change of clothes. I mean, I, I was just my laptop, my phone and no, I had no addresses yet. I had no, like I had done no research. So you so, literally just knew that some owner lived in this city and you yes. just flew to the city. Yeah. I just flew to the city. Yeah, awesome. And, and right. I flew to the city because I also like Thanksgiving flights, there wasn't that many. So I had to go early. So I had, I had to leave. I had to make up my mind if I was going to go or not like kind of thing. So, um, so showed up and did a little bit of research on the plane while I was boarding and stuff. Um, found a couple addresses. And so uh, when I landed, it was, it was still good afternoon checked in the hotel and then I ordered some Ubers and like a lift got in the lift and started scoping those addresses that I had just pulled. It was like five, six addresses with the lift driver. I was scoping them. And then, you know, he would pull over and he would, you'd park and I would tell him like, Hey, turn off, turn off your car. I turn it off. Like, so, so the lift was freaking out. The lift driver was just super paranoid and wasn't letting me focus and stuff. So, and it was Thanksgiving day. And I was like, you know what? I, I was all fired up. I was thinking I was going to go knock on their door on Thanksgiving. Yeah. But I, as I was there, I was like, you know what? I'm going to respect everybody's space. But I know now that there's some movement in this house. Like there's someone here. And so your so, Lyft driver thought you're a stalker, which you basically yeah. were. Yeah. Yeah. So all I right. said, I was like, you know what? Take me back. Turn around. Take me back. This is not going to work. Um, and so I rented a car. Um, and so I kind of, you know, was just by myself Thanksgiving. I went to Golden Crow, had some turkey by myself, but I was so motivated to find this guy. So I started doing some research on Thanksgiving day. Um, and honestly, all together, I did about seven hours of research, um, including, you know, Thanksgiving day and the next morning, um, before I found about 25 addresses of people that may know who, where this guy is. Uh, you know, I found kids. I was Instagram stories. I was, I mean, inst I was following everybody. I mean, dog accounts. I mean, I found it all. Um, and so on, on, uh, on Facebook marketplace, I confirmed where the owner lived because he had posted something for sale and he had took a picture of whatever was for sale and that his house came out in the background. So as I was driving around scoping, I knew that was his house. I was like, wow. all right, this is, this is the guy. And so, um, went in the morning, knocked on his door. I parked kind of far away. Uh, I don't know why I was just kind of nervous, I guess. And so I parked a little far away, got off the car, walked to the house, knocked on the door. No one answered multi-million dollar neighborhood Denali's outside. I mean, mul I mean, uh, multiple millionaire, this guy. And so, um, so knocked on the door, no one answered, came, got back in my car, drove around, drove around, came back a couple hours later, knocked on the door. No one came out. Same thing. Drove around a little bit. I actually went uh, to go eat and I met a guy there. He gave me a shot. So I like all my anxiety kind of went through the roof. Um, and like so, a shot of whiskey. Yeah. Just a, yeah. a shot of tequila, 1942. And I was like, all right, earned right. it at so, this point. Uh, yeah. So, so I'm going to go, I'm going back. It's like seven, seven in the evening. I go back. I'm like, I'm going to try this guy one more time before I start knocking on his relatives. Uh, I wanted to try to, my best to find, to go straight to the guy. Um, and so third time knocking on the door, his wife comes out finally. And she's like, who are you? Like, who, who, what, what do you want? Like, who are you? And I'm like, I'm Adrian. I'm the buyer of an apartment. Um, and I'm here to talk to, you know, your husband. And, uh, and she was like, oh, like, like we just went through a drive by shooting. And that's the reason why I didn't answer the door. Like, I'm so sorry. Cause she was watching me knock and I was leaving. She had the their room. house had been shot up in a drive by shooting. Yeah, they put 30 bullets in her house one week before I door knocked on her house. So she, she, she was like, sorry, it's because we went through a drive-by shooting. Look, like, look at the window. And I turn around, look at the window. There's bullet holes all over the window. And I'm just like, oh, crap. Like, I have my mask on. I'm like, 
Yeah, you know what? I'm so sorry. Like, I, I, I don't know why you even opened the door right now. But, but, and she's like, okay, no, it's okay. It's okay. Now I know who you are. Let me, let me call my husband real quick. And I was like, no, 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 don't call him. I'll wait for him right here. It's okay. He'll be home in a little bit. I'll wait. Nothing. So, uh, so she called him and he's like, Hey buddy, you wasted a trip. Like you, like you, you, I'm not selling anymore. I'm not extending the contract. You're going to waste your time. I'm not like, sorry, buddy. Like, so he kept telling me, buddy, sorry, buddy. And I was like, no, 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 no. Sorry. You, you, sorry. Like, I want you to tell me no in person. That's all I'm asking from you, sir. I just want you to tell me no in person. I feel like I deserve, you know, an in-person meeting right now. Just, I mean, we, we, we did a lot on your property. And I don't even know if you know what we did because he was a, a passive silent investor. Um, and so, so he, so I set up the meeting with him the next day, uh, super nervous. I get back in the car when he, when he's uh, like, when he says to come back to his house the next day, I get back in, in my car. I call Mar Mauricio, my business partner. And I was like, yo, we have one shot, man. Like we have one shot, like one chance, one chance. I got him and set up with a meeting with me. Like that, that's it. Just a meeting. And on the phone, he had told me, I want the, the only, the only way I'll extend it is a quarter million more for two more weeks. And uh, your earnest money goes hard. If you can do that, maybe. So, so, I mean, I already knew we were kind of tight. Like I already knew like that's a lot of money. So, you know, we were starting, starting to think of all kinds of ways. I mean, Mauricio was all fired up. We were all, we had one more opportunity go the next day. I mean, in the morning, I woke up super early. We started coming up with a bunch of scenarios that he may, you know, be telling us about. And so uh, finally went to his house, met with him. Cool guy. I mean, you know, very welcoming. He let you into his home and you guys had him into in his home. I did that on purpose because he sure. was, he was asking me to meet at a, like a coffee shop. And I was like, I mean, you know, do you mind if we just meet here like on purpose because i mean when people like exactly like you said when people are inviting you over to their house you know it, it's already a sale right so um so went into his dining table you know he was laughing like he was like just laughing at me just how i was able to do that like and go there and be there so um so then you know we we're talking for the first four hours um you know we didn't talk about the apartments we didn't talk about the deal we didn't talk about anything else building rapport building rapport building rapport talking about his airbnbs traveling i mean i was trying my best to make this sale go through i mean this is probably the the biggest sale i've ever done in my career so sure. um guy liked me i got the guy to like me made a good friend and uh we ended up structuring something pretty creative on his two hundred and fifty thousand, and i bought ourselves another month um, and then, you know, basically just got the extension done. So, uh, got back in the car, called Mauricio. I was like, we're back in, man. We're back in. We're not losing the deal. <laughs> Call everybody you called already and tell them that we're doing the deal. And I remember when, uh, you know, when he was, when you were telling him like, Hey, uh, you know, this is big players this is a big game. I mean, you might take some L's along the way we've had to, you know, <laughs> take some L's and I was driving past his house as Mauricio is telling me this on Bluetooth <laughs> in the car. And I'm like, no, we're not losing it. Like, and, uh, and we got it done. We got it done. It was, it was very emotional. We finally funded, uh, very, you know, relieving, but you know, I think it, it comes, I did nothing special, Devin, to be honest, I did nothing special. It's, it's, it was just a mindset that I had of, of, if I'm going to lose, I want to know that I did everything in my ability to, to, to try to win. And, and if I can sleep at night, knowing that I did everything that I could have possibly done, that's fine. But I mean, having that mindset has helped me a lot. So I think, there, uh, yeah, there's no doubt. And man, thank you for telling that story. First of all, congratulations on getting that done. And I think um, it is extraordinary in that you were, uh, you know, willing to put yourself in extraordinarily uncomfortable circumstance for an extended period of time. And I think that's what it takes. Uh, you know, that's the difference maker, I think, in, in a lot of in a lot of situations. And it clearly was here too. You know, one of the reasons I want to record this episode was to be able to point people back to it in the future and say, you know, when when somebody wants to give up on something, say, oh, go listen to Adrian's story. You know, tell me if you think you've if you've exhausted all your options or if you're really just throwing in the towel too early, right? Um, because at the end of the day, that was a lot of discomfort. It was, 
certainly getting outside your comfort zone, but you know, you're going to have this deal for years to come. And, and really you kind of invested really what amounted to a matter of days as uncomfortable as that was. And that, and now you're, now you're the owner of a, of a big multifamily project. And the next one is going to be, was definitely going to be easier than that. Yeah, I could tell you yeah. that, but yeah. the next one will be easier in a lot of other ways too, because now you're kind of in this, in this world of owning uh, larger multifamily assets. So, uh, you know, congratulations on that. And I, I just think it's an awesome story of perseverance. And um, the first time you told me that story, I was like, you got to be kidding me. Drive-bys and the guy let you in his kitchen and he flew out there on Thanksgiving. And he got and shot, actually. He got shot a week before I knocked on his door. And he, he was shot in the drive-by. In a drive-by, he was shot. And he had a bullet in his body still from a week ago and and, and this is a nice neighborhood right for seven hours on his dining table all of his business partners would tell us like he, i don't know he's the most strictest he's the hardest person to deal with he he you don't want to upset him when i found when the when the other three owners found out that i was on his dining table they they were they were like praying for me like just like at, at, to how strict they made him seem right. That was super cool. Super yeah. cool. Once and we through. chatted it up amazing. We had a great high level conversations. And I think that um, also like, I mean, I, I tell people, you know, how people ask me, how'd you do that? I was like, dude, I, I've been doing that for seven years. It took me seven years of, going on eight March will be eight years that I've been in real estate, but it took me eight years to be able to do that. It wasn't right. done. I, it wasn't done overnight. I didn't just go fly over there and, and ha be able to hold a conversation with him sell him, get him to sign an amendment. I wouldn't have been able to do that. It was eight years of constant grind and, and, and yeah. perseverance, like you said. Um, but, you know, he ended up like we were talking about. So they ended up being equity partners. Um, but Amazing. one of them. They're invested in the deal. Yeah, they're, they're invested back in the deal. <laughs> and so, uh, so one, of the, one of the main guy, the majority partner, a multimillionaire, and I was showing him the structures of a multifamily syndication, 30, 70, 25, you know, 75. And he was like, so what if I'm this guy? He was, he was circling all 70%. Like, I mean, what if I'm just your one guy and I'm your LP? So, I mean, not only were we able to buy the deal, they're invested in the deal, and he's a potential passive investor, you know? Amazing. And a, yeah, from, and a big one. From, so, uh, Losing a deal, losing your pursuit costs, having to go back to all your investors and and with your tail between your legs and wire funds back to closing the biggest deal of your career to date. I mean, that's 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 that that's that that's that pressure. That's like what the 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 six feet from gold kind of thing. Like, that's right. Push, that's right. push, 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 push as hard as you can. I mean, multifamily is hard. I mean, we were talking about it the other day. Not a lot of people get through. Right. Not a lot of people get through. The ones who get through are the ones who really 10x and do everything that they possibly can do in order to get the deal done. I mean, I can't imagine. I mean, that, I can't imagine going back. We would we would be at 40 units right now. Right. Yeah, like, that's incredible. From 40 to 130. I mean, we're going backwards. So, I mean, I, I, I wanted to do whatever it took and I wanted to be able to sleep at night, to be honest with you. Yeah. And your next one might double your portfolio size very easily. Right. And one more deal. Boom. Double it. So, but that's, you know, and it's going to be easier than this one, but that's all a function of all that work you put in the front end. Have you seen uh, Slumdog Millionaire? You know that movie? Mm -hmm. It's a good movie. Have you seen uh, Groundhog Day? No. Okay. There's a couple movies there. The premise of both of them is that they struggle and suffer the whole movie. And at the end, there's a big payoff that happens quickly and looks easy, but only because all that struggle. Right. And so, you know, you've, you've put in the time and, I think the the subsequent multifamily deals that happen for you guys over the coming years are, are going to be um, kind of reaping the reward sure. of all that hard work on the front. End. So that's sure. incredible. Uh, it's an incredible story. Um, congratulations on getting that closing done. Maybe as we kind of wrap up here, Adrian, just a high level 10,000 foot view. Now what on the property? I mean, you got it stabilized. You got the agency loan. What's kind of the game plan just in summary for, for what you guys have planned over the next year uh, on the oh. property? we're rocking and rolling. I mean, we've created our business plan. You know, we spent a lot of time developing that coming up with a you know schedule, you know, what kind of materials, who, what personnel is going to be here. We've, we've already, we were planning all that throughout the, you know, acquisition. Sure. That way when we close it's go, right. It's, it's yep. plug and play, go, 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 go. 
Yep. So, I mean, right now we're, we're replacing all rotten fascias, you know, soffits across the building. Um, Monday, roofers are coming in. We're replacing the entire roofs. Oh, we got the owners to also uh, do the claim for us. And we got, um, we're going to get about $160,000, $170,000 check from their, from their old insurance um, to replace all of our roofs. Uh, we have a bunch of work going on, uh, you know, next week. Um, we're renovating two units, full-blown model units with our color, new color schemes, fixtures coming in, um, you know, residents transitioning to a new portal. We're starting to implement, you know, the, the new payment software is we're really starting to uh, enhance, you know, at least the property curb appeal, landscaping. That way we can start then asking for rent raises. So we like to do things first for them. And then, and then we ask them to do things right for us. Right. right? So, yeah. um, so we're really just cleaning up the property now, but we're going to bring in uh, some landscape, you know, architects to come in and give us some ideas on landscaping, um, art, a little bit of art. Um, we're definitely going to implement a bunch of lighting. We're going to light up the entire property. So we're going to start a pretty massive reposition. 18 months is our plan um, to deploy about $600,000. Outstanding. I love it. I love it. We'll look forward to getting updates on that project. Adrian, congratulations on that closing and thanks for sharing the story. It's very inspiring and I hope uh, some listeners take away a lot of value. I, I, no doubt they will. If somebody wants to reach out, connect with you, learn more about what you guys are doing in the future, what's a good avenue for them to do that? Sure. So they can find me on social medias. I think it's pretty, uh, pre I'm pretty active on Instagram. Uh, Adrian Salazar, you'll find me. Adrian Salazar underscore uh, on Facebook, Adrian Salazar, you can find me as well. <clears throat> we, uh, we, me and my partner represent 210 Management, so you can probably find a little bit about 210 Management. Um, and I mean, just you know, reach out. I actually have a link on my uh, social media so you can schedule a call with me, 15 minute call. I'd love to, you know, share anything that I can, value, free call. Um, and that's kind of how I would see anybody taking uh, taking action and getting a hold of me. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we'll link to that in the show notes. Uh, Adrian, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate you sharing the story and continued success to you. Thank you, Devin. Appreciate it, sir. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thank you for listening to the DJE podcast. For more information, please go to djetexas.com.